All right, so this is part two in continuance of our study on eschatology. And again, I'll just do a brief summary. Eschatology, it talks about the doctrine of the last things. When all said and done, what happens to you at the completion or the culmination of everything that you know? Do you just live here now and you cease to exist? Do you live for a time being and, you know, one passes away and then, you know, do they go to heaven? Do they go to hell? Um, this is what we're looking into. Because why? The end time things, we know that uh, the scripture for it that we have, that I can give, again was, uh, I believe it was Revelations. Was it 1 and 8, I believe? Yeah, 1 and 8. I don't know what's going on with the thing here, but I'm going to read that. It says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So this is from the Almighty, okay? And we know that Yeshia himself, you know, has come from the Most High. That's what he said. You go and read into the book of uh, John chapter 15. He says that he has come from the Most High. And he, does not have, he doesn't bear witness of himself, but the Father bears witness of him. So when we're talking about eschatology here, we're talking about a time. This term designates, according to the scriptures, concerning the final consummation of all things. So where do you fit in that? Because we are, if you will, a product of creation. A product the Most High has created us. So in other words, we all have a timeline. I believe the account according to the scriptures that we were created eternal. So I just want to state that first. So the lesson that we're going to go into um, when we go into you know, some of this information is you're going to see some people that say that there's a time period that you may not. Some people don't believe that you were created to just live forever. They believe that, this is some people, okay? Some people believe that, you know, those who are in Christ, now these people who believe, they say they believe in Christ, right? They believe on and about Him, that if you're in Christ, then you get eternal life. If you don't, then you just cease to exist. But there's a few, there's a few things, there's a problem with that. And the problem is, is that the Bible tells us according to, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, as we read last week, that all people must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that they might receive the things of which they have done. Okay? And, and I'm looking right here, the things that they have done in their body, right? In their flesh, and they're living now, whether it be good or evil. All right? Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, or Ecclesiasticus, that I, let me go to it real quick. Ecclesiastes, excuse me. Ecclesiastes 12 and verses 14 says this, For the Most High shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So now when we're talking about eschatology, we're talking about things that pertain, listen to this very carefully, the second coming of the Messiah, the judgment of the world, the resurrection of those who have passed away or are asleep, okay, or what the world would say is dead, and, right, the creation of the new heaven and earth. All right? So these are the things that we're going into in this particular study. All right, so here we go. It says, two views current with evangelicalism. Arguments for the conditional immorality, immortality, excuse me. At the present time, two primary views regarding the nature of punishment of hell are being advanced with evangelicalism. That is, among those who have a very high regard for scripture and the necessity of personal faith and new birth. 
The first view is called conditional immortality or annihilationism. Though strictly speaking, the two are not precisely the same as we are outlined below, as they are outlined below. The second view is often referred as traditional view. Right? So the so the second one is going to be as a traditional view. So several things are important to note in this discussion. First, this is not, as some have erroneously argued, a debate directly related to inerrancy. All right? Let's look that word up really quick. Let me see what this, what this word here means. Second, we're looking this word up here. So that we can find out what this word means. <laughs> Alright, biblical inerrancy. As formulated, it says. It means biblical inerrancy is the doctrine that the Bible is without error or fault in all its teaching, or at least the scripture in the original manuscript does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. Now we understand what, again, uh, okay. inerrancy means. What does it mean? That the Bible is without error or fault in all of its teaching, or at least that scripture in the original manuscript, the original one, okay, does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. So it says, um, the best evangelical theologians on both sides of this issue are committed to the Bible as the most highest inspired and trustworthy word. It is rather a question about the best exegesis of what that word in resultant theology. So again, exegesis you said that meant is gives an explanation to uh, that which was pertaining to something religious. Yeah, it says it's a critical explanation or interpretation of a text. So, uh, so let's really get it. So, a critical explanation uh, according to the text, right? Biblical text. So text. Especially in scripture. Mm -hmm. Especially in scriptures. Okay. So that's what exegesis is talking about. So something that's critical um, according to uh, the biblical text that is written. So it goes on and says here, um, it is rather, I read, I read that part. Second, and again, theology, understand what theology just means, understanding. No one can truly understand the Most High is beyond finding out. But theology, in a nutshell, is understanding the Most High. Okay? Uh, second, this debate is not about whether the wicked will be judged or not. Both sides agree that this will be the case. The debate is about the nature of that judgment. Now we're talking about today eschatology, so we understand that judgment, you know, that that has the, you know, that comes to things pertaining to the end time. And if you look into the book of, now why do I bring this up? Because if you look in the book of uh, Ecclesiasticus in our apocrypha. Uh, chapter 11 and verses 28 it says judge none blessed before his death okay so I understand that means you can't say that someone's you 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 looking at we looking at people and here's the example I can give the example I can give is we can say man so what is blessed blessed means altogether things are going good you're happy you know you're blessed right well how someone may look at blessed some people may feel like they're more blessed than others because they have more things or accumulated more or people who don't have as much as other people may look at those people that do have those things as if they're more those people who have, who have all those things are more blessed than they themselves when the Most High has given every single one of his creatures the things necessary to bless them he's given us what? he's given us raiment, food and shelter you have those three things you're blessed that's the be that's the, the essential of saying blessed but so again, when it says, when you're calling someone blessed, because why? You might look at, 
these people who are prominent in society who, who, who the world says, according to the world's standard, they have it all. Now, you never know at the end of the culmination of this person having everything, the final part, what, what's, what's their state going to be? So this is what the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus, chapter 11 and 28 is telling us. It tells us, judge none blessed. Don't, you know, don't say that everyone's so blessed before his death, for a man shall be known and his children. So in other words, after that, after that person lives, and you know, the legacy that they leave to the children, in other words, those are the people, your children, your offsprings, are going to carry on, which you basically be like you. So if it's someone that fears the most high, they're leaving the, you know, they're leaving a good, how do you say that? They're leaving a good, uh, example. yeah, good example, but so what, what does someone leave behind? It's a word that comes to mind. I can't hear. Legacy. Inheritance. I said the le an inheritance. You're leaving a good inheritance behind. So your inheritance, you're leaving this back behind so that way it, it can continue on. So the legacy or the inheritance continue on from one generation to the next. Right? So that's why it says don't call anyone blessed before they before they passed on. Right? You never know what's going to happen at the end of that person's life. Right? So let's continue to go on. So... Now we know that the debate is about the nature of that judgment. Conditionalists, wait, condition, conditionalists argue that the conscious, listen to this, the conscious suffering component is temporary. So conditionalists, they said that's just a condition for just a time. It's only, the word they say is temporary. And that the most highest judgment will ultimately result in the non-being of the wicked. So in other words, that with that saying is that the wicked will just at some point was just simply seem to not no longer exist. And what does the scripture tell us? The scripture tells us we have to get some some things ready. Let me, let me pull this up here. It says that the fire, the unquenchable fire. So that means that the the fire in this place is unquenchable. It had never stopped. It goes on. The worm that never dies. They would inherit this thing. Also, if you look at Luke chapter 16, and I think that we went in and we talked a little bit about that last week. If not, maybe I'm just, because I read a little bit before, and I'm mentioning that. But we'll see that there is a consciousness that on the other side, that people are conscious to, you know, their surroundings, right? So, conditionalists argue that the conscious suffering, meaning that you know, man, you suffer, you see the torment of hellfire, you know, what, what people would say is demons, and, you know, be, which, which are demons, right? And, and you know, these, these creatures pouring out the wrath of the Most High on the ungodly, right? And so some people, these conditions says that's just a condition for, you know, for, for a time. For that journey, and then they cease to exist. Traditionalists, listen to this, traditionalists argue that conscious suffering component of the Most High's judgment is never ending. So the scriptures, would, at this point, I would view on the side of the traditionalists because the scripture tells us, and I'll get you the scripture here, it tells us that it never ends, right? I can think of Matthew 25 and 41. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Let me put it up here on the screen. Matthew 25 and 41. We'll get that really quick, all right? That's one that I know right off, off the bat. 25, let's see what this says. Matthew 25, 41. It says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand. Who is this he that's saying that? Anyone? Who, who is this he that's saying this? When, when you look in the scripture and it's written in red, it tells us Yeshai. The same Yeshai is the same one as the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, right? Yes. So Christ is saying, he says to those on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed. So now you look at these people were cursed, what? And it says do, to do what? Curse where? And to where? Everlasting fire. Just, just for a momentary fire. Everlasting fire. What verse is that? I can't see it. 41. Well, right? Matthew what? 41. 25, 41. Okay. All right. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Right? 
So that's what Yeshua is saying. The, the one that is the Alpha and Omega, who, you know, the, the beginning and the last. I was just going to that one script. I'm going right back to what we were reading, Yeshua. Back over to what we were talking about, the traditionalists, right? So traditionalists argue that conscious suffering component of the Most High's judgment is never ending. And at no point will the wicked cease to exist. So in, in other words, we're talking about the Most High's judgment. We, because some people say it's wrong. How? So what is the conversation? Here? Why is it that a loving God He'll condemn someone to hell for, for eternity, forever? It just, it's not, they're going to just cease to exist. You live, you, you die. Okay, and some people they, how they use pur uh, purgatory in, the, yeah. the, in Catholicism. Yeah. You go here for a time being to be punished, yeah. and then after that, you know, you can be. Some people say that, you know, you can come from out of purgatory. Okay, and that's what they'll use on that second part when the books are opened up. Now, we're going to go, we're going to cover some things today. We're going to go into the book of Baruch as well and see about the judgment, the things that pertain to the end time. Because that's what uh, eschatology is about. The, the, the things that pertain to the end time. Right? So now, here we go. It says, Third, Inflammatory rhetoric has no place in this debate, nor in any debate for that matter. For it is, for it only serves to alienate and to distort and retard understanding of others' views. This does not mean, however, that a person cannot roundly criticize another views, another person's views, right? But this should be done with, they say, Christian civ civil civility. And with the goal of furthering all of the Most High's people. So in other words, when we're speaking on these particular things to brothers and sisters when you're debating, and, and it's, this, I think, for one personally, that it is something that, a conversation that does need to be had, even amongst Israelites, okay? And remember we talked about brethren, okay? Amongst Israelites, because there's some Israelites who, for one, they believe... They believe that there is no hell. Okay, and they'll say that. There's, there are people who we, whether they identify with being an Israelite or not, we'll say, okay, you know what? You come from the seed of this people, you have fit for curses, you're, you're going through what the Bible says, and we try to bring the knowledge to them of who they were, and how we have fallen as a people, and they'll still deny it, right? So, you know, we still try to bring the information to them because... What if, what if they didn't believe? They don't believe they're Israelite. They don't believe there's a hell. Does that mean that the word of the Most High will have no, none effect? That's the question. A absolutely not. Whether they believe it or not. Because we understand that the Bible, as that word, the inerrancy of the Bible, is without, it's infallible. These prophecies will not fail. They're happening. There's proof of it. The video that I said, if you go to the Holy Armor Ministry, the one of Pastor Charles Lawson, you know, I mean, there were people who did not believe at all. They didn't believe anything about the spiritual stuff. The nurses and all of them were confounded. You guys got to go see it. And, it, you know, the, pray up. Because, again, like I said, even when I, when, when Pastor Charles said it, he said, listen, this is not something that I say lightly. Because you're going to think about the stuff that makes your hair stand up on your neck. Okay, it's that stuff because... All of us know at some point. We've all experienced it. If you live on this earth for 20, 30 years, you've experienced, you've come across something that you cannot explain. Some type of thing that you cannot see it, but you feel it. There's brothers that I know personally. I've experienced it. We're praying, we're, we're praying in the spirit, warring. And you feel this present trying to intimidate you. This is real, brothers and sisters. So, nonetheless... Just because someone chooses to think that, well, if I just not acknowledge that and just don't believe it, then that doesn't that doesn't really that 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 just cease to exist. No, it's true. This the word of the Most High is true. All right. So let me continue to go on. So as we share with our brothers and sisters, whether it be Israelites or even Christians, our brothers. I'm speaking to our brothers and sisters in Christ who believe in Yeshua, who follow Yeshua, the, the the Anointed Messiah then we must, we must have that dialogue and be able to talk with our brothers and sisters in a respectful The truth must come out. The truth is going to stand out whether 
one disagrees with his brother or sister or not, the bottom line is that the Bible, the, the, the Bible is, is, is definitely what stands. Michelle, you shouldn't take her out like that, Michelle, especially without a wrap on her feet. Yeah. No, you can cause more infection. Okay, yeah, you can't take her out there. I knew she was going to leave, leave it there. You can't. Okay, let me continue on. I don't know why you got up and take her out right now. Okay. Now, let me continue on. It says, Now, this does not mean, however, that a person cannot roundly criticize another's views, but it should be done with, you you know, with respect and decency. Like, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, everything decent and in order. And if she's leaking blood on our carpet, Michelle, is that thing bleeding? Uh, okay. I didn't even know okay. Yeah. So now let's continue on, right? So and when we're doing this, it's all to further the kingdom of the Most High mm -hmm. and to bring people to wake our brothers and sisters up to the truth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, wake up all the Most High's people in the truth on this or any issue, but most importantly on this situation because it's true. If you don't prepare now, you can spend all your time investing in studying and everything else, but miss this one principal thing, or you miss the smallest minute thing, and it costs you the most biggest thing, your salvation. Mm -hmm. By you not believing in what Yeshua said, because he spoke on hell more than often than, than not. He warned, he told the, he told the people. Okay? Alright, let's, let's go on. So, it says, Fourth, let us take to heart that this is a discussion about hell and the awful judgment to come upon those apart from Christ, i.e., upon many whom we know and love. So, wait a minute. We're talking about the fate of people that we know and love. Okay? And listen, let us, let us take heed to this because, you know, you can, one may be talking about if you're not careful and take heed to the, pro the warning of, of Yeshia, we ourselves can end up in this place. Not that the Most High, because remember, when you, when you understand what you're talking about this place, it means to destroy and pine away forever. The Most High says it was not His will that any should perish, mm -hmm. but that all should come to repentance. But some people feel they don't need to repent. What do I need to repent about? I haven't did nothing and said nothing to no one. I'm just a kind person. I'm kind-hearted. Mm -hmm. And some of those things may be so, but you still need to learn about the righteous one who walked the earth, right? Who lived the perfect life, who pleased the Most High. Okay. So, look what it says. It says, So it's talking about the awful judgment that come upon people, anyone, that doesn't know the Most High. Right? So let us mourn with Jeremiah and weep with Paul over the ultimate destiny of anyone and all those who refuse to know the love of Christ, the love of Ahia. What is the love of him? So in other words, the love of the Most High, First John 5 and 3. Keep his commandments and they're not grievous to us. We just went to the book of Ecclesiastes 12 and verses 14. It said that, let me go to it again, so that way I don't quote it wrong. But it said, For a highest shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. So everything that you see, your thoughts, remember the, th the thoughts that you have hidden from everyone else, the things that you don't disclose? Mm -hmm. The Most High is going to bring that into judgment. So how do you think about your brothers? If everyone would just judge themselves and stay on alert for themselves, then, you know, you give the enemy less opportunity to use you. All right? So understand that the whole conclusion of everything, the, what this all really culminates to at the end of the day, the conclusion of it is that we must fear the Most High, like it says in Ecclesiastes 12, uh, and 13, we must fear the Most High and keep His commandment because this is the whole duty that was given to man under the, under the sun. It's for the, the whole duty of mankind, right? 
So going back to where, where I left off at, right? So we must we must be compassionate when we're talking about the fate of those who do not. We're not looking at people and saying, oh, you know what? You're laughing at those who may be in Christianity, you know, worshiping on Sunday and, you know, celebrating the world's feast. And, you know, we look at them with a compassionate heart. We're not looking at them laughing. You, you pagan, ha <laughs> ha, you know, you're going you gonna to go to hell. Not, that's not the case at all. Yeah. You know, because why? We were, ourselves were once there. And I like to think that because we stay connected to the choice vine, Christ, our growth in Yeshia through the Holy Spirit, we're bearing more fruit. So this is just another part <clears> along <throat> more more growth along the journey. Okay, and hopefully and prayfully that those who may be in whether it be Christianity, whether it be in some what they will call a camp or that we pray that as individuals first, your first how do you say this? Your first loyalty and your first devotion is to who? To the Most High. First, and to His priest. Mm -hmm. Second, okay, so Yeshia, mm -hmm. down to the person that's under Yeshia. That you be loyal to them and, and, and uphold them with integrity and honor. Okay? And, and you know, you know, believe them for the work's sake. Okay, but when anything that goes against the, the doctrine of Christ or the word of the Most High, because it's infallible, this is always the instruction that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished, there it is, thoroughly furnished, able to rightfully divide the word of truth, unashamed of the Most High's word. Okay? <coughs> so, now, it says, this is a very sobering doctrine. No matter what side of the issue one comes down on. And, and let me make this, let me put this out there. This is one of the core principle beliefs as far as being my brothers and sisters that, that I congregate with and that I associate with. And me as a teacher, as, as a student, a disciple of Christ, I believe in the doctrine of judgment. I believe in the eternal judgment. I believe that there's a heaven and there's a hell. Okay? And I'm, as the Most High gives me the the increase to understand it, I believe it as the scripture lays it forth. It's mm -hmm. not that hard to, to see. Mm -hmm. I believe the, the account of Luke chapter 16 when the rich man woke up in the flames, mm -hmm. being tormented in a flame. And we they, we got, got these scriptures here. So this is what we're going to go over here for the next, I would say, the next couple of weeks or so. Eschatology, preparing ourselves. All right? Let me read a little bit more, and then we're going to jump over into the book of 2 Baruch. Let's see what else we got here. Now, before we discuss the relative merits of the conditional immortality and the traditional view, let's take a minute to clearly distinguish conditional immortality from other annihilist, align, excuse me, annihilationist perspectives. Okay, Walter Field has outlined annihilationism in three groups. One, peer mortality. Right? You know what mortality is? More than mortal. Yeah, just mortality is just, you know, flesh. Flesh. You only, you just, the mortality of it, you're only mortality. You're, you're only, you're not, because immortal means to be, <coughs> immortality means to live forever. So mortality is the opposite of immortality, right? Conditional immortality, that's number two. And three, annihilationism proper. So pure mortality based as it is often is on rather strict materialism sees no hope for the person beyond death. In other words, the life, what's that burning smell? Oh my goodness. Okay, in other words, the life of the person is impossible without the body since the life principle is inextricably connected to the physical organism. So the life is connected to, in other words, your heart, your brain, you know, your eternal parts. Without any of those, there's no life, right? At death, let's do it very carefully, at death, all people simply pass out of existence. Right? That's the mortality part. 
That's what something they may believe, right? Mm -hmm. They just simply pass out of existence. You ever heard of the saying? To, like an atheist tell you, well, you only live one, you only live once, mm -hmm. and that's it. You only have this time right here. And they're not spiritually discerning in them because they've been blinded. Mm -hmm. That, wait a minute, there is something on the other side. Okay? And so the devil would trick people into believing that. So that way, ultimately, that they would, you know, they would receive his judgment. And they would <coughs> partake in his torment. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because he knows that we're made in the image of the Most High. So what does he hate? The image of the Most High. And what is the image of the Most High? Both male and female. Right? And just perfect unison. So understand that the attack is real here. It's a spiritual war, brothers and sisters. The attack on the image of the Most High. Both male and female. Now you got man with man, woman with woman, right? So there's there's an onslaught and attack happening, right? Okay, let me continue on. Let, let, let's try to stay focused over here. So uh, conditional mortality, generally speaking, argues that people, let's do this, let's what it says. They do not naturally possess immortality. So you understand what the conditionalist says. They say that people do not have uh, immortality, right? In other words, they're not eternal. That's what some people believe. Some people believe that you're not eternal. So they don't know about that after, you know, your life that you live, that the Most High is going to actually judge you based on the things that you have done. We're going to read that here shortly here. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, but must receive it from the Most High. So there's there's some truth to that because I understand death as we understand death, true death, as the Bible tells us, don't fear the one who can kill the body, but fear him who has the power to put thy soul in hell after he has killed. Right? Mm -hmm. So we know that death, or the second death, is basically being separated from the Most High forever, yeah. being cast out into outer darkness, mm -hmm. all right, being cast into the great lake of fire. That's what the second death is. So one, to truly have life, they must have Christ, but yet the Most High, because he has made man in his image, and we're going to read this here in a second, he breathed in man, and so man became a living soul, and so that eternal part of the, of the Most High that the Most High has made to live, the Most High had to also prepare a place for it. And you'll come to find out through the study that he, that he has prepared a place. Right? So, the, the, the conditional mortality, generally speaking, argues that people do not naturally possess immortality, but must receive it from the Most High. The Most High, for his part, gives it only to those who are in Christ and eternally connected to the Savior and His resurrection by faith. All other people, i.e. unbelievers, simply pass out of existence. Now, see, we understand that the Most High does give life, right? You get quiet down, please. You have to quiet down because I'm trying to focus on what I'm talking about. The Most High gives life. He does give life. He quicken, even now, His Holy Spirit is quickening us making us alive to his, his word. That's the only way that we're interested in interested in his word now. Because if we did not have the Holy Spirit, did not give us life, we wouldn't be interested in it. We'd be wanting to do the things of the world. We wouldn't be able to, uh, how would you say it, um, to really sit for a moment and really take it all in, if, if that makes sense to you. Be able to take it all in and, you know, not only get something from it, but in, in response, from what you're getting, you're able to give too, right? Give to others, right? So these people simply believe that one passes out of existence, either at death and or after a general resurrection. So they believe after a resurrection, now we know that the scripture doesn't say that. When you look into Josephus, when you look into, there's many sources that says what happened. Well, the righteous will get their glorified body. And I have a lesson that what is called what happens to the soul after the quote-unquote death, right? And that's also on the Holy Army Ministry website, okay? 
So what happens to the soul after death? Well, the righteous soul, okay, on resurrection at the time, at the consummation, at the finishing or the completion of everything, well, that righteous one, that, that, that those are who are found in Christ, believing and trusting in Him, who love not their life unto the death, who kept the Most High's commandments, who live by grace and faith in the Most High, who exercise and who have the fruits of the Spirit. See? And I'm just talking about just people that were just Israel or whatever. Although it's very important that Israel <coughs> does make it as well because the Most High and Christ are concerned for those of us of Israel. Okay? So I'm not going to exclude my brethren of, the, of the, the tribes of Israel. But they need to know, too, right, that you must have the Spirit of the Most High in you. Trust and faith must be in Christ alone, meaning that that's the principal thing that saves saves you, that delivers you from the wrath of the Most High. Now, because Yeshua lived the perfect life, his suffering, remember, because he suffered, he offered up in anguish, he offered up his soul as a sacrifice for humanity, if you will. And that just means mankind, man and woman alike, so that all who would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting eternal life. That they would, but those who don't have life, so separate from life, is this death. So some of these people just seem to think they believe in Christ. Now, now I'm starting to understand this, even in my walk as a young man. Now I can see why people say that, you know, this doctrine of hell, that's not the, you know, so they're giving people what they say is hope. Well, what happened to your loved ones? Your, lo your loved ones that you may have known never never lived anything for the Most High. Never cared to lick about the Most High a day in their lives. Right? But yet, you tell them, you know, now they'll have a chance here. Okay? And or they, they did things in defiance of what the Most High says. And, you know, their loved ones who are left here on earth have been wondering, thinking about what happened to my loved one and, and this and that. Right? You'll come to find out that in this lesson, that when we receive our change, the same way that how it is now, we are uh, compassionate towards people, but when you receive the change, you're no longer ever, ever, you're not going to concern yourself with what happens to the unrighteous. And if you don't believe it, I'll give you a scripture right now. In Jeremiah chapter 15, it says this. Let me go to it just to show you. Now, this is here right now. Notice those of us in the truth, we all have, because why? That's almost... That's almost like a torment to us to, to, to continually be sorrow and sad and well, what happened to this and, and this person? And, come on, now we, we want to go on in joy and happiness and paradise, right? And we trust that the Most High, through Christ, the Savior of all men who believe on Him, right? I'm getting Jeremiah 15 too to show you to show you the scripture here. 15 I go to it right now. So I don't. I can't quote it just like that. But I know some Jeremiah 15 just came to me. Jeremiah 15. Back to my point that I'm making. That when we receive our change. Yeah, 15 and. Seventeen. It says. Let me go from 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. So we're listening to the word of the Most High. We found them, and we're eating them. And thy word was unto me, unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So you heard the word of the Most High. You begin to, re to rejoice about the promises of the Most High, being delivered and being saved, that there's a place for the righteous. There is a God that judges the whole earth with equity, that's righteous, that will reward every man according to their work. And no matter how much money you have because of your circumstances that you're in, you may not have a gazillion billion bucks or, you know, you know, have the luxury of the things of this world, but yet the Most High looks upon you favorably and He loves you unconditionally. In spite of your downfalls, in spite of your frailties, in spite of your mistakes, He loves you and wants to, to, to just wrapping, wrap His loving arms around you. Okay, and, 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 and show you what he has for you. I also want us to get here, and while I'm saying this, we got to think about the carpenter, you know, Joseph's, uh, Joseph, the father of Yeshia. 
okay, how it said in, in the story and account of him, the righteous carpenter, that he said in the world to come, if one even has a, 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 just a cup of water for the world to come, it's better than all the wealth and riches of this world. Nowadays, you know, some of us brothers and sisters, we look at people and we marvel like, what this person is blessed, they have a million, billion, they got a mansion, they got a five-story home with seven bedrooms, eight bedrooms, they go on vacation, they have savings, they don't have to worry about this, they don't worry about that, their children are set. Sometimes myself, brothers and sisters, I think about that, and when I think about it in a righteous fashion, saying that, Most High, you are the, you are the heritage of Jacob. In this world, I'm not a billion or a millionaire or even have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? And so the inheritance that I want to give to my children is I trust of the Most High God, surely as you see us coming live from the middle of our home here, that the, as the Most High have provided the roof over our head and give us the means to pay for this place and put food in the cupboards and to keep the lights on and to keep His, His sweet spirit, you know, stimulating the souls within inside of the four walls or all the walls in this house, he will continue to stimulate us and bring us to our our place where we're, where we're going to be in the kingdom. So there's something much greater than this momentarily or temporary, you know, visits that you see all around us. So the point that, again, that I, that I can give is that the most high is not a respect of a person. You don't care how much money you have. Sometimes I think about the work. That's gone. Sometimes we run into people and they say, well, yeah, you know, brother, you know, this work, you're doing a good thing and it takes money and this and that. That we know. But we know how people are with money or whatever the case is. People, that's their God. Money is their God. <laughs> okay? And they, and, they, and they worship their money because their money gives them the things. It gives them pleasure. It gives them happiness. Let me read this to you again. Jeremiah 15 and 17. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, right? Nor rejoice, I sat alone because, well, I'm sorry, I jumped up real quick. Let me go back to, to 16. Matter of fact, let's go from 15, because this is key. You have, we have to get this on here. It says, O Most High, Jeremiah 15 and 15, O Most High, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. So now, People are persecuting us. Right? Take me not away in thy long suffering. Because why? The Most High is long suffering to all men so that they would repent. So in his long suffering, what this is saying, Most High, don't let my understanding get corrupted because in your long suffering that somehow I get turned out of the way and now I don't have the life that you have given to me through your shadow. You can experience it now, brothers and sisters. You don't have to wait till you die. The Most High gives you the Holy Spirit right now. You can experience, you can manifest, I, th I think it might have went off. Okay, did it go off during? No. Alright, you can manifest heaven right now. So so listen listen to what it says. So take me, take me, take, take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. So now people are rebuking what we're saying. And rebuke, again, means to, you know, to put something off, to correct, okay? Now people are trying to correct us and coming against us, right? Thy words were found. We found thy words, and I did eat them on verse 16. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Most High, high the power of hosts. Verse 17, I sat not in the assembly of mockers. And the Bible tells us in past times that we did have our pleasure along with the world. Remember? That we were servants unto them in, in fornication and in, 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 in adultery. All these, these different things that we had pleasure in unrighteousness, right? We surely did those things, right? Do you have pleasure in them now? No, you don't. You look at those things and you say, you do what? You hate those things. Those things are a snare. Those things are stalling you and they'll get you thrown off. Right? They're, they're a distraction. Right? So it said, now listen to this. I sat alone because of thy hand. So the most high hand was upon us. For thou hast filled me 
with indignation. So now we'll see all these things that the world is doing. And what happens? You get hot at it. How can they? That's what we say. But in that, in your patience, you still must possess your soul. We must understand who is a brethren. Okay? How do we entreat a brethren? <coughs> who is an enemy or is a straight foe? Now remember, Yeshua says that a foe won't just be like as your enemy, but it'll be those of your own house. We must consider that how that the Most High has brought in us and remember, remember me, Most High. When you, next time you pray and you're praying to the Most High, say, Father, you know, taking me, you've taken me from my own family. Your word was joy and rejoicing to me. And because of that, I suffer rebuke. Who's doing it? Some of your own family. The same people, the family that you were born into. Okay? And they, they don't understand it. And so, but with that being said, brothers and sisters, we must also be patient with them until and, and, and continue to pray for them while, while the time is still here. Because the scripture tells us that those who are strong in the faith pray for those who are weak in the faith. And so because of that, because we're standing in the gap, uh, why? Because you have a standing, you are known of your father, you know the father, you know the Holy Spirit. The father is you know, sparing us some of the hurt, too, as if he were to just take them out the game. When I say out the game, just remove them from the face of the earth. He's very compassionate. And, you know, so we have to think about that. Okay, so I'm going to go back into what I was reading here, right? So now, you don't just simply, and, you know, I don't want to be biased on it, but, I, again, I believe that there is a judgment that, you know, you live forever. But where do you live forever? Okay, and that's just a hard, that's just a simple fact of it. Right? Because the Most High's Word is sovereign, it's forever. Okay? Now here we go. It says, some people that, again, remember this was who? This was the conditional mortality. That's what they people think. So you just conditionally, you're mortal for just a moment. And my belief is that, listen, you're... The Bible says this. Let me quote something from the scripture. The Most High says that my spirit, he says, I will not always strive with man. In Jeremiah, where is it at? Help me follow it. Oh, wow. Where is it at? That's right. It's right. Come to me. Is it 17? I might be quoting the wrong one. Because man is also flesh. Isaiah. Isaiah 55. That's it. Isaiah 55, chapter 55, the Most High says that he will not always, verse 51, I have to check this real quick. I will not always strive, I think it's 51 and 17. I will not always strive with man because he is also flesh. My spirit will not, you know, stay with man because he's also flesh. So understand that that part of man, and remember that the spirit and the flesh is always warring against each other. So, me, brothers and sisters, being transparent to you, this is the things that I war with in my mind. So that way I have a good standing and have a good understanding. The Bible says a good understanding in uh, Psalms, I think it's 110. Psalms 110 and 11. A good understanding are all those who keep the most highest commandments. Okay, and I'll go back for that. But let me just look at this for one second. Isaiah, I said it was Isaiah 51. 17. He's also flat. That's the one I'm looking for. It might be 55. Okay, well, never mind which one. I think I might have quoted some, some wrong one. But I know what scripture I'm talking about. What's on my mind. But let me stay focused here. So, again, you know, we must make sure that we walk in the Spirit and, and do everything that we can to stay in the Spirit. All right? Now, I'm going to continue to read on the information I have. So, it says, either at death 
in or after a general resurrection, or after a general resurrection in a period of suffering, which some people said call it purgatory. Now, the Bible says again, you know, because I keep going to this part, I like to explain as, as you know, to understand what we're reading. So there is a time when those books will be, the books will be opened up, and we know that if we make it on the first resurrection, then then the second death has no power over us because we've overcome. And we're with Yeshua. We stay with Him. So when those book, everyone else, the dead, they were not seen. They're still in hell. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of prophecy, speaking of scriptures, how the, the Bible talks about, right? Until that thousand year reign and then after that and then that great white throne is when you look into Revelations, I believe it's chapter uh, 5. Right, and then when you look in Revelations chapter five, and there was a great white throne. Make sure here I got it right. Yeah, and I saw him who sat on it that was written. Uh, who, uh, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written therein, written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel. All right. So yeah, Revelations. Uh, Revelations uh, four. Yeah, Revelations 4 <coughs> and 5. Okay, that Revelations 4 is talking about that the throne seat of the Most High. Okay? So this is all stuff that, you know, pertains to the end times, right? So now let's, let's read a little bit more. Let's go a little bit more into this here. So, I think. Now. Annihil annihilationism proper in contrast to the conditional immortality builds on the idea of the person as naturally immortal. So the person is naturally immortal. Thus at some point whether immediately at death the judgment after a general resurrection or after some determined period of suffering those apart from Christ will be annihilated. The Most High Himself will bring their very existence to an end. So there are some people that believe that, you know, wait a minute, you are immortal, but the Most High is going to destroy you, and then you will cease to exist. And again, that's, that's the distinction of the annihilationism. Okay? That those who believe that, you know, you're just facing annihilation. Um, the scriptures, but what does the scripture say? So this is just a view of, you know, people who believe the Bible, but just having a discussion. But that's all this is, a discussion. Is it still going to rain? Yeah. Now, arguments for conditional immortality. Now, we are now ready to discuss arguments for and against conditional immortality hereafter. So remember, when you see CI, that means conditional immortality. And traditionalism. See, I. So, uh, conditional immortality has received increasing support among certain evangelicals in recent years, including Edward William uh, Fudge, John W. Okay, none of that stuff. Let's just jump down here. I want to get right to the point. Okay, that, that's not very uh, so perfect as far as the message that we're sending forth, that we're bringing forth in the study. Okay, so a lot of people, evangelicals, are cleaving to the CI, the conditional immortality. That's what, so you're conditioning immortality. At some point, the Most High is going to come, and He's just going to destroy you from off the face of the earth. You just cease to exist. That's what they're saying. And some people might be okay with that. It might be okay. And only those who are in Christ that follow the Most High, they'll continue on living, and you know. They'll live in peace and harmony while everyone is just utterly, they're just utterly destroyed by the Most High. It's the Bible says that. Okay? So I'm, I look for the scriptures to, to, to tell us this. Now, let's go in here, right? And look at, uh, let's look at, is it stand, uh, what is this word? Exegetical in theological grounds superior to traditional views, and is it thus to be preferred? Okay. Now let's go to the meaning of destruction. All right. 
It says proponents of the conditional immortality argue that the Greek verb apolium apolimi apolimi means to kill in the active voice and to perish or to be destroyed when in the middle voice and and transitive for example when Herod sought Yeshia he did so in order to kill him that's Matthew chapter 2 and 13 also Yeshia told people to be afraid of the one who could destroy that is kill both body and soul in hell okay from such evidence uh, Stock concludes that if to kill is to deprive the body of life, hell would seem to be the deprivation, the deprivation of both physical and spiritual life. That is an extinction of being. So they said someone would go to hell for them to, to, to be to to be put out. In other words, when I say put out, to be exterminated, right? As a waste place. Now, a few scriptures that come to mind to me, I'm going to get it real quick. i got to look this up real quick. I don't know. Uh, one second. I'm going to show it to you right here. And I would lead you to the book of chapter, uh, Mark 9, and we'll go from 44 to 48. Let me read that here to you. I'll put it up here to you. Yes. Can you shut that window for us? Oh, you guys told? Yeah, everybody, I think, told. Sarah, I got it. Yeah, watch that. I got it. I'm good. Okay. Sorry. What? You're not sure I'm affected. Uh-uh. Somewhere. Somewhere around here. I remember I put some change. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I put some change back in it. I think it might be in the studio or back in the room somewhere. Um, I said Mark 9, right? Yeah. We're going to go into this here until... This is very interesting. It really is. And I hope it's interesting to you all as well. Okay, now, 9 and we'll just start, we'll start at 43, alright, because, or 42, and, and the example in a nutshell just is saying, if anything that you have in you, this is Yeshia again, warning us, warning us, that his, his people, alright, warning his disciples, a disciple means a student, so our teacher is warning us that if we have anything, an eye that is, that it's better that we cut it off. It's better, verse 43, and if thy hand offend thee, or cause thee, right? Cut it off, cause thee to sin, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life. There we go again, there's the life. Maimed, then having to, uh, two hands to go into hell, into the fire. What does it say? That never shall be quenched. Now, this is Yeshua. Yeshua said that it shall never be quenched. That's his word. So, I mean, that's not even for me. I don't even need to speculate about anything. I would just rather steer, I'd rather steer clear of, the, of that. Yeah. I don't want to find out, <laughs> to be quite frank. So, I, myself personally, you know, I would say, listen, I'm going to love on the Most High and, and follow and obey Him. I'm going to fear and tremble before Him. I'm going to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. And I'm going to obey His Son, okay? 44. Look what it says. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45. And if thy foot again, reiterating, if thy foot, so if you if you got feet, you just cannot stop from sinning. In other words, it's telling you that if you have a relationship or if you're doing something that is contrary to the Most High, that is causing you to habitually Sin. You have an habitual pattern of sin. You need to cut that relationship off. 
Okay? If you're hanging around people that are doing things that causes you to sin, that, that, that you know, you're not strong in that particular area to resist it, you need to cut those people off. Okay. You found it, Michelle? No. Okay, you need not to be around those people. All right? Verse verse nine, Matthew. Uh, uh, it's Mark nine and forty. No, I mean verse nine. Uh, Mark nine verses forty six. It says again. Okay, that, wait. I went from forty three, right? Yeah, I, I was yeah. on forty four. Yeah. Forty five. Yeah. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter, halt into life, than having two feet, to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So while we're talking about eschatology, things that pertain to the end times, some people's end, some people will, me will meet their end. Okay? Every three seconds, and this is a study that I did back in 2007, I think. Every three seconds, there was 180 people that died. And I was just fascinated. One, two, three. This, people were coming out, people were coming in. And so through this study over the next uh, few weeks... You know, I pray that we have, you know, we get a, a, a better understanding, an in-depth understanding on this, on this lesson here, right? So it says here, it's, so it's better, you know, that they enter into, uh, what does it say? It is better for thee to enter into halt, into life, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire, that never shall be quenched. That's the second time he says it. Found it, Michelle? No, it's okay right now. Verse, uh, verse 46, Mark 9 and 46. Reiterated, where? There. There. T-H-E-I-R. The worm dieth not. It never dies. And the fire is not quenched. Right? I think I said the 48, right? 47. And if thy eye offend thee, if you, now we got to be, see now, he's telling us something here, brothers and sisters, because if we know that we're in the spiritual war, the enemy would try to use our eyes, because as a portal, to come into the temple of the Most High, to cause us to sin. He would try to have us put our hands on something, or desire to want to touch, or feel, or to do something, to cause us to sin against the Most High. He'll want us to call, the enemy will want to cause us to walk in a, in a way of rebellion, rebellionness, that's the word, rebellion to the Most High, to rebel against the Most High and cause us to sin against Him. And by default, we inherit His judgment, the place that was prepared for Him and His angels, All right? Um, verses, uh, middle of 47. So if the eye offend thee or cause you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of Ahia with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And he's going to reiterate it again. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So again, Yeshua spoke so, and this is heavy, it's in red. Just so open your Bible up and... Uh, you know, these are things that we really need to be, be looking looking at, brothers and sisters, those of us in the truth, to make sure that we are not, to make sure that we don't wind up in this place. Learn about it. Learn what our blessed Savior warned us of, to take heed. Learn about it. We're not learning about these end time things to be just fascinating, like, oh, wow, this is interesting. We're learning about it because our blessed Savior warned us of these things. Because if we had done these things that go against the Most High, then, you know, he already prepared the judgment. So, you know, you're free to do what you want to do to make the decision for yourself. But just know that there's consequences. For, and, 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 you know, there's consequences and repercussions. And, you know, if you follow what the Most High says, again, like we read in Jeremiah 15, man, what a joy, right? It's such a joy to uh, have the word of the Most High. It's our joy and we rejoice in it. And don't let the devil turn your joy and rejoicing in the Most High's Word into anguish and to just being bored or saying that the Most High is not right or He's not fair. But the Most High, He's not, he's not fair. 
Okay? It, 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 you know, it's us. It's us that, that, you know, we, every man, or woman for that matter, is lured away when, you know, the things within inside themselves, if they do not exercise temperance and so and that's self control. Okay, and that's another fruit of the spirit. Self control so that way your foot and your eye, <laughs> you know, or your hands don't lead you straight into the path of destruction by the natural, quote unquote, natural fleshly carnal man. And the spiritual man that he be empowered or she be empowered, okay, and is able to continue to do what's pleasing to the Father. Right? So again, so perishing, right? So we're looking at perishing. Now, we see here that in Matthews 10 and 28, it talks about, you know, also Yeshua told the people to be afraid of the one who could destroy. That's speaking of the Most High. That is kill both body and soul in hell. That's Matthews 10 and 28. From such evidence doubts conclusion if to kill is de I read that part is to deprive the body of life hell would seem to de uh, to be the, the deprivation of both physical and spiritual life that is an extinction of being further in the middle voice and while in transit transitive the verb means to perish okay as in the case of unbelievers who are said to be perishing all right so this person stop also argues that the noun uh, apologia, a p o l e i a, apologia, okay, and uh, how would you pronounce that? Aj lekro, okay, o j l e q r o, or or left. Ros, O L E T H R O S, also mean destruction or ruin, as defined by an extinction of being. Okay, so that's what they're saying when they're looking at this particular word. He concludes that it would seem strange, listen to this, therefore, if people who are said to suffer destruction are in fact not destroyed. Now, see, that's a play on, 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 on words to me, you know. They're pining away. They're receiving their... They are destroyed. They're, they're in a place... A place of ruins. There's no hope. There's no... You know, there's no getting out of it. I mean, this is a serious thing to look at. You know, okay? There's, there's now no place for a repentance. And see, that's why I said I needed to get that. I think it's either in the book of Enoch where it says there's one just sentence, and I'll get it, that's going to lie on the lot. That's gonna, when I say lie, I mean like to come down, not like telling a lie, but to lie upon or come down upon on the both the righteous and unrighteous. Okay? That one just sentence and decree. All right? And... Um, You know, the righteous, again, they're going to receive their change. And those who shun the law of the Most High, they're going to go back to the same state, the same sicknesses, same illness, and the same, and just they're going to pine away forever. That's what the Scripture says. I believe what the Scripture says. Now, first, it is true that the, that the verb, it says, here's the response. First, it is true that the verb, a polyam, can mean to kill or put to death. But it is a non uh, as it says, secure to suggest that killing. Now, here's a word that I'm not used to seeing. Okay, and remember that these are these particular theologians or, or, sco or scholars here are just having this debate. Okay. Okay, let's look that word up. Can you look that word up for me real quick? Up? The secure, secure, sequitur, and that's S E Q U I T U R. So, but it is not a non security to suggest that killing necessarily entails extinction of being, even if the killing is done in hell. This is true for at least three reasons. So we're just going to get the definition of this word here that's being used. And we'll have Aaron read it out. 
of an in, uh, inference of, or consequence. So a conclusion of an inf, uh, inference and then a semicolon consequence. Hmm. So the conclusion of it, huh? Mm -hmm. It's in the... No, it's a quitter. It's a quitter. Okay. And again, like I said, I mean, I'm looking at the definition of it. That maybe that I put non there. So read that one more time. It says, uh, definition of sequitur, uh, the conclusion of an inference, and then has a semicolon consequence. Okay, so now we see that's, that's the conclusion uh, about the non-conclusion to suggest that killing necessarily entails extinction, extinction of being, even if the killing is done in hell. This is true for at least three reasons. One, language of killing is phenomenological. It's a big word here. And is not, therefore, necessarily making any metaphysical claims about being or non-being. Two, to regard physical killing as extinction of being implies a certain underlying of man which has been subtly, subtly, imported into the definition, but which has not been established. I refer to a monistic view of man or certain Christian versions wherein life cannot exist apart from embodiment. So they go back to that word apoly, apolumi, apolumi, if I'm pronouncing it right, A-P-O-L-L-U-M-I carries many other meanings other than to kill. It could mean to be lost spiritually. So it's saying that someone would be lost spiritually forever. Forever. Here's your chance to get it right, brothers and sisters, or be lost forever. Okay? That means you go on, and I mean, my goodness. It's just best... It's best for us as believers to steer clear of hell. Straight up. Okay? Don't find out. Don't go there and find out. You stare, you know, if, you, if, if it seems like you're going through hell here on earth, then, you know, prayerfully this will be the closest thing to it for the, yeah. the true believers as opposed to go. It's nothing, it's nothing that you want to, you don't. You don't want to go there. Okay? I don't. All right? So... You know, we'll keep, continue to do what the Most High says and uh, continue to praise Him and bless Him and follow His Word. All right, don't let no man just beguile you to thinking when your blessed Savior told you, if your hands, your eyes, if your feet, you know, take heed to yourself, take heed to the doctrine. We must, we must really be careful or else you get bamboozled and you, you get led right down the, the path of destruction. Now, remember the Bible tells us, right? I believe it's in Luke 13, right? 13 and 24, somewhere around there. Or, uh, I'm not sure if it's 24, but Luke 13, I know. And I'm talking about that path. It might be 23. That the path, that wide path. Let's get that really quick. They're talking about destruction, right? So Luke 13 says, where is it at? Where's the wide at? Okay. So broad is the path that leads to destruction. That's the one I'm looking for. Oh. The straight gate? The straight gate is 24. How about that broad this, one now? Oh, uh, this is, uh... Oh, the broad way? Yeah, the broad path that leads to destruction. Oh, well, you, we, we gotta read this here. Wow. Mm-mm-mm. Right here, Matthew seven. It's in Matthew, yeah. Well, how about in Luke too? Is it in Luke too? I don't see it in there. Okay. Matthew 
So that's broad as the path? Okay. You said Matthew what? 7 and 13. Matthew 7 and 13. Okay. Here we go. So Matthew 7 and 13 says, we're talking about destruction in it, right? It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Right? That means ruin or loss. And again, here's the word it gave us in the Greek that we're looking up to. It's G684. Okay, when we're talking about the Apollia. A-P-O-L-E-I-A. -E G684. From a presumed derivative of G622. Ruin or loss. Physical. Spiritual. Or eternal. Damnable. Nation. Destruction. Die. Perdition. Perish. Perniscuous ways. Waste. Alright? So that's what that word means right there when we're looking at that. Apollia. From G684. Now going back into what we're reading. How much time we got, Michelle? Did Terrain go to get? Yeah, he did. Now, we still haven't even been able to go into Baruch yet. I mean, I, ha I have it all right here to, to go into. It. We, we must lay this foundation down really quick to look at this. And then when we go into Baruch and all the other scriptures, it's, it's just going to flow. Yeah. It's just going to flow. I'm telling you, brothers, it's just going to flow very smooth. You're going to get it. You're going to see it. All right? But just be patient. All right? So, what does it say then? It says that we, we left off right here regarding the physical killings. That now look what it says. So a polyam carries many other meanings other than to kill it. It can mean be it can mean to be lost spiritually, like Matthew's ten, verses six, Matthew's fifteen and twenty-four, to lose a reward. So wait a minute, your heavenly father gave you a reward. Now we know when we go into the book of Revelation, I believe it's in Revelation twenty-one, it says that I hope y'all remember the right one. That all those whose names were not found in the book of life, they were cast out into that place of the lake of fire. And that's the thing with me. 20. Sometimes that's 20. It's 20, brother? Yeah. <laughs> 20 and uh, 15, last verse. Go ahead and read that for him. Read that. I'll start at 14. Uh, it says, uh, in death. So Revelation, Revelation is 20. Yeah, and four, I'll start at 14. Go ahead. And, um, oh man, that's so much. Did you want me to get the whole book of life? No, I just, I just wanted that part where if their names wasn't in there. And, and uh, 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There you go. So if your name, you have a reward. Now, what, where's another reward? Um, another one, where's the crowns? Man, it's just so, it's just so many that I'll have. Like, you know, the most high, like I can think of in 2 Ezra chapter 13, it was saying Yeshia was putting crowns. It was seen that, that Ezra was given the vision of this time, like those who, you know what I'm saying, at, at the completion of all of this, that, listen, when this all ends, brothers and sisters, we're going to receive a crown. We know Revelation talks about the white robes of the great tribulation. Get your robes and your garments. No more sicknesses, no more illnesses, no more diseases. This is what I like to draw your attention to when we talk about the end time. It's not just so much about, you know, and I don't want anyone to mistake this as someone, you know, they're talking <laughs> doom and gloom. They're fear mongering. They're just trying to scare you into living your life. They want you to do this. It's not even about that. But it's about telling you the truth and, you know, giving you the proper measure of both because you can't have one without the other. What I mean by that, you should also know about, if I'm going to teach and tell you about the Most High's wrath, then as we just read, someone could lose their reward. Well, what reward? The gold streets of walking in the New Jerusalem. Being in a place where there's no more killing, there's no more murdering, there's no more adultery, there's no more evil thoughts trying to lead you from life to death. You don't have, you don't have to worry about that anymore. There's no more tempter tempting you saying, come on, let's do this. You, you wouldn't do it. And in and, and, and the world to come, when you receive your, your glorified body, your spiritual body, 
You know what I'm talking about? You know, your physical body's going to rejoice with your spirit and your soul and be like, man, you're going to just be made new. From that point, nothing can destroy it. No weapon that they could ever design could ever do anything to those who have received their, their change, all right, in the Most High in Christ. So let me continue to read. It just makes me excited. This is exciting to me, brothers and sisters. So understand that that word there could mean to lose your reward. Matthew 10, 42 says to lose one's life, to destroy. Okay, now also look, Matthew 16, 25, to destroy demons. Okay, uh, Mark 1, 24, to ruin, to ruin a wine skin. So in other words, the, the things that was holding wine and the bottles. I also said Mark 2 and 22, to drown. Mark 4 and 38, to deprive someone of needing healing. Right? So you need healing. You need to be, like, here's the, here's the example we can give. Let's go to Luke, uh, Luke 16 now, of the rich man. The rich man in there. So here's an example we can give of someone that was put into a place. Okay? And, uh, the rich man opened up his eyes in hell being tormented in the flame, right? And I believe it's right down on... Uh, 19, 20, 22. Luke 16 and 22. Go ahead, read, read the 22 and 22. And it came to pass that the, uh, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So see now, look, to some people it seemed like the poor of the earth are the beggars. Man, look at those beggars. They've been begging for a job and this and that. This is the thing that I tell you that I think about. The righteous here in the earth, right here and right now. We the sons of Jacob. All these other nations have, I mean, the way they're put together into an, to, an, to a point. You know, the Bible tells us not to envy the sinners, okay, and desire the things that they want. But, I mean, at, you know, when you look at your own nation, I mean, it drives one it hurts, you know, a wise man, it drives a wise man mad, if you will. And so this is why we must be renewed in the spirit. Because we're like looking at our people and saying, man, how come we can't come together on nothing with all the talent that we have, yet there's something amongst us that we'll look at each other and we want to, we don't want to see someone that looks like us doing as good as us or better. <laughs> it's just like, that has to be a curse. It has to be. And even when, when people do have, you know, uh, you know, good plans and intentions on doing something, always some, some contention, at some point of contention or difference or variance comes up to where they can't never accomplish or complete that task. But at the end of this, remember, Yeshua says that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, says the Almighty. But go ahead and read, brother. The rich man also died and was buried. 23. And he's on 23. Luke 16 and 23. Go ahead. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. So now, so listen. So if anyone want to tell us that hell is the grave, or you want to, anyone wants to talk about they don't believe there's a conscience. So anyone that wants to say that, you know, there's no consciousness, read that again, brother. What happened there? And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. So that's the, that's the point that we wanted to just bring out right there. That he was in torments, okay? Now this is the, the example, like I said, the example that I can give. Let me go back to where we, the information we have. And we were looking at, you know, he was being deprived of someone needing healing. Go ahead, continue to read what else you got there, brother. So this person was in hell. Read, read, read what you got. Uh and seeth Abraham afar off, and, and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay, go ahead. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. So we see that he needed help. He was being tormented in a flame, right? And... You know, the response was, go ahead and read the response. 
But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. So, in, in, in other words, if I, if I may interject and just add something to that. So, Laz, Lazarus, right? The poor man who, who was looked at as a beggar, right? He received, he was going through misfortunes. But yet, this rich man had everything that one can, more than one could desire. Got more money than you could spend in a lifetime. And this won't make any sense right here. To, I mean, the logics of it. I mean, the only thing that resolves all of it is the blessed scripture. It tells it. Mm -hmm. This is the only this is the only place where we get solace and peace and the answers by the living word of the Most High in the good book. Go ahead, read, brother. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. So now he is comforted. He's being rewarded, and like uh, likewise, the the rich man is being deprived of those good things. See? Of, of the healing. Is, is that it? I mean, there's more. I mean, there's the off between and all that. We, uh, yeah, that's just going into... Yeah. So that, that's the part we were just talking about. So, of course, brothers and sisters, you know, Luke, <laughs> Luke 16. Uh, what verse was that? 20, 23 to 20... What verse did you stop at? Um, it was uh, 22... Oh, Luke, Luke 16, 22 through... 25. Through 25. So I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, read the read the whole chapter of Luke chap chapter 16, if there's any doubt in your mind of this particular place. So we're talking about destruction or being or destroyed. What does it mean? All right. So I'm gonna continue reading on here. So now, so to deprive someone of needed healing, right? To lack a relationship with the Most High. That's in Luke. Uh, you know. Uh, Luke 9 and, and verse, what was that, what, 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 verse 24, as a reference to lost sheep. Luke 15, verses 4 to 5, a lost coin, a lost son, a lost people. Let's get this really quick. Luke 15, tw verses 24 and 32, since we were writing the book of Luke. Let's read what this says. 15 and 24. Or is it 19 and 10? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Luke, Luke 19, Luke 19 and 10. 19 and 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which, is, uh, which was lost. See that? So when you look at that, that Yeshua has come to save which what was lost. And some, some, some Bibles, they take that total passage out there. Yeah, Matthew 18 and 11, and 11 is yeah. not in the NIV. So, so here we have it, brothers and sisters, that Yeshua came to save or deliver or rescue that which was lost. So, who was the lost? Because when you look at you look at Matthew 18 and 11, it says he's come for the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's who it was lost. They was lost from their purpose. So Yeshua had to be that sacrifice to put them back on the path. So that way, that also, you know, they and in, in, in itself, they would act as saviors, if you will. And when I say savior, that means by them following the Most High, following Yeshua, showing others, being examples to others. Delivering, you know, delivering this gospel to the people, they would save themselves and the people who adhere to this to this gospel, right? So we know that Israel is at the Most High's first son. I have I have a, sh a short lesson. It might take about thirty minutes. I meant to do for the weekly exhortation, but this last week was just you know it was super blessed. A lot of reading and working on music. I, I wasn't able to get the, the exhortation that I planned on doing, but believe me, you, brothers and sisters, I have that exhortation. I'm going to record it, and it needs to be recorded and, 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 uh, and archived, because it is some straight jewels in it. Okay, back to what we're reading. All right, so i.e. apart from Yeshia and salvation, to perish as opposed to receiving eternal life. So in the day of judgment, when we're speaking of end time eschatology, and see, this is a good place to go into the book of Baruch right now. 
just right here where we were talking about. To perish as opposed to receiving eternal life. All right? And I think I will go there. I'll go a little bit to, into the book of Baruch. Okay? And I want to go into verses 24. They'll probably be back in about like 10, 15 minutes. All right, perfect. So we got about five more minutes, and we got, like I said, tons of more to go into this, all right? Again, we're speaking on end time, preparing for the coming of Yeshia. We'll start at 24. Where are you going? Uh, the book of Baruch, chapter 24 and 1, all right? It says, For behold, the days come and the books shall be opened in which are written the sins of all those who have sinned. As we just read in the book of, uh, maybe we can go there and take a look really quick. I think you said it was Revelation 20. We talked about the book of life. Yeah, but did it, uh, did it also say all, it said the books were open. I'm looking. Yes, there's, there's a couple verses before that. And 12. Okay, so we know that we, we have Revelation 20 and 12, and then we also have Revelation chapter 5, where it talks about those books. So I'm not going to go there and read them, but I just wanted to bring that up, because when, as you see what we're reading in Baruch, that's what it's talking about. It's referring to that, right? And it says, and again, also the treasures in which the righteous of all, those who have been righteous in creation, is gathered. Let me read that again. For behold, the days come, we're talking about eschatology, we're talking about end time events that pertain not only to you as an individual, but to the world and the culmination in its entirety. From the very beginning, all the way from Adam and Eve, all the way up until the very last person that is standing on the face of the earth. The days come, and the book shall be opened, in which are written the sins of all those who have sinned. Right? And again, also... The treasures, that's why it said books, plural. So now we have a book, that's a record being kept. Treasuries. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Treasuries, plural. We have a book that accounts everything that everyone has done to go against the law of the Most High. And then you have books talking about the works. And that's the ones that works of people, the things that people have done. So the Most High may reward every man according to their work, whether it be good or evil. And again... All the treasuries in which the righteous of all those who have been righteous in creation is gathered. Two, for it shall come to pass at that time that you shall see in the many that are with you the long suffering of the Most High. So many of that are with Baruch, they'll see the long suffering of the Most High. That means his patience, his compassion as he continues. He is very patient, right? Some people count the long suffering of the Most High as slackness. As they'll say, man, you know what, wars and all this stuff has been going on. Ain't nothing changes, you know. That's why I used to believe in the Bible. They'll say it. I used to believe it until I found out, and that's what they'll say, you know, that was foolishness. You know, I, you know I, when I didn't know any better, I, I believed. But then you start to say, well, you, did you ever have the Spirit, though? Uh, See, that's the, that's the difference. That, that is the absolute difference. You can be reading the word of the Most High without the Holy Spirit, and you'll never get it. You'll never get it without the Holy Spirit, right? So look and, 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 and watch for the Holy Spirit. Okay. So it goes on and says, It come to pass that we'll see the long suffering of the Most High, right? His long suffering, which has been throughout all generations. Who has been long suffering, has been very patient towards all who are born. Both those who sin, those who go against the Most High, and those who obey Him. Um, to obey Him is to be a righteous act. Okay? Those who follow the Messiah, those who are within Christ, the body, right? And it says, verse 3, and I answered and said, but Behold, O Most High, no one knows the number of those things which have passed 
nor yet of those things which are to come. I like to lead you back to, and I like to, uh, you know, bring your attention to Revelations one and eight. Again, it says, Revelations one and eight. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. And speaking of your shot, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And then we had another scripture that we went to, and uh, I believe it was Jeremiah 43, where he says, He declared and spoke of the things, He called it into existence, the end time things from the very beginning. See, and that's what I went into last week. Okay, so but go, going back to uh, uh, 2 Baruch chapter 24, it says here, in verses, I was on verses 3. Uh, verse 4 now. For I know indeed that which has befallen us. Right? But what will happen to our enemies? I know not. Now this is what Baruch is asking. So Baruch was shown through the blessed scriptures what's going to happen to them in their generation. They broke the most. This is speaking of, you know, the southern kingdom. Broke the commandments of the most high. That true worship. That pure worship. Right? And the worship got tainted. Going back to praise. We cannot let our praise get tainted. We cannot let our worship get tainted. We can't have our mind. We cannot have a distorted or authoritative mind when, you know, coming before the Most High to praise Him. When we praise Him with our all, because the Bible says, and I'm glad this brought, came to my, remember, my memory, there's a time, listen to this, when the, the real worshipers, Yeshia said, will worship the Most High in this mountain. Speaking, you know, they're speaking over to the, the, the Samaritans, right? And the Most High, He requires and desires and, and, and wants those as such to worship Him in spirit and truth. The true worshipers, right? The true believers, right? So, Baruch says, For I know indeed that which has befallen us, but what will happen to our enemies? I know not. So the question is to us and to you all out there who may come across, do you know what has happened to us? Now we see why all these other nations are built up and when they have a, we have, I have my grandson on the couch here. And I'm so glad that the Most High is my inheritance. That I put my trust in I don't Again, I don't have a gazillion billion, a billion bucks. But my, I'm, I'm rich in faith. Okay? And the Most High continues to provide for me and my sons. And I, I really live my life by faith. I really do, brothers and sisters. I mean, you know, those who may not know me, who may see this part, or this part of the video, if you watch this video all the way through, through, because I know, again, how people look at videos, they look at something for a couple seconds, lose interest, boom. But for those who are linked in with us and appreciate and are blessed by it, I really live my life by the faith, okay? And I'm not just saying that, because if I didn't, then, you know, my wife and my family and my brothers and sisters here who know of me, would, they would call me on it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and rightfully so, they should. So here it goes. But what will happen to our enemies, I know not. And when, when you will visit your works. All right? Marie 25, uh, and these are very short here, and 26. Second Baruch 25 and 26. 25 and 1. And he answered and said unto me, You too shall be preserved till that time, till that sign which the Most High will work for the inhabitants of the earth in the end days. And what do we say that eschatology was? It is the doctrine of the end times. So here we go. We see that Baruch is getting much needed help. Right? Right? He's not being deprived of the hell. The world deprives us because we're not of the world. If we were of the world, the world would be our friends. It, you know, there'd be all the high fives and cheers. And man, you would see a line out the door. You, you get what I'm saying? We'd have a bit. Everybody would be wanting to know this. How come this is not on the radio? <laughs> How come you guys aren't preaching on the radio and, you know, people are signing up to be baptized and all of that? You got the truth? They run from it. <laughs> They run from it. Straight, straight, straight up. They out, they gone. Leaving shoes behind everything. 
<laughs> I'm out. <laughs> Just out of a sense of humor, but I mean, it's really, it really is, it really is serious. It's speaking, it's speaking, especially on what we're talking about here today. All right. So two, this therefore shall be the sign when a stupor shall seize the inhabitants of the earth, and they shall fall into. And let's get the word stupor. Anybody know what stupor is? Uh -uh. No, it almost sounds like when something just throws everything out of course, like it just throws every takes everybody by surprise. Everything's out of order. That's what it sounds like. It's commotion. That's what it sounds like to me, but we're going to get the definition of stupor. S-T-U-P-O-R. A stupor shall seize. Do we got it? A state of near unconsciousness Let's or insensibility. A drunken stupor. Now you tell me, wait a minute, the Bible says that there will be darkness and gross darkness. A state of, uh, what would you say again, brother, the definition? Uh, a state of near unconsciousness. It's like people are walking around as though they don't see people dying, being murdered, and killed, raped, mayhem, as they don't see everything falling right before their, their right before their very eyes. And no one's concerned until it actually on their doorstep. And that seems to be the status quo how just mind your own business. Insensibility. And they're insensitive Everyone's like, you know, if they would only judge themselves. Don't be going around looking at if you're a man, you know, hitting on someone else's wife. Or, you get what I'm saying? Be respectful. If you're a woman, don't be, you know, trying to lure off another woman's husband. You get what I'm saying? Don't be doing these things. Everyone's in sense it's all about me, 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 I, 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 what I feel and what I think and my personal feelings. All right? So that's what the stupor is, okay? So the stupor, any, anything else, brother? I mean, this is it's just an example. It says Go ahead. they left him slumped in a drunken stupor. So you see that? So they left him deprived. Now listen, I am my brother's and sister's keeper. I'm not going to leave you deprived. As long as, as breath is in me, I'm going to live my life as an example. I'm going to intercede. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to lift my voice up and pray, lift my hands up. I will be an intercessor. Okay, we just got a couple more brothers and sisters, and we're gonna to have to wish you a higher speed. All right, so this 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 has fell on the earth, brothers and sisters, beyond any shadow of a doubt. And uh, this verse, I mean, chapter twenty-six. It's not very much. Either. Okay, so it says, "A stupor shall seize the inhabitants." And many tribulations, and again, when they shall fall into great torments, and it will come to pass when they say in their thoughts, by reason of their much tribulation. So now, all of a sudden, right? Let me make sure I got this right. Oh, yeah. So now, people are now saying, wait a minute, was I deceived? I, you know, what the Most High has forgotten about? There is no God. See, this is the time that we're living in right now, if you can really recognize it. And notice how you may have had brothers and sisters who are in the faith, and they no longer are here no more. They know a stupor has now, it's right here. We're speaking of end time things so that you can see. Not only just that one or two or three or four or five or hundreds of people, but I'm talking about in droves. Hundreds of thousands of people are falling away. Every day. But yet, those who are steadfast, we will receive the kingdom. But we got to understand that. we got to go through and understand what has befallen us. We under, Just like Baruch understood, so a great understanding. If you have an understanding, then those things, when they happen to you, you won't be shaken so bad to where you're moved. When I say moved, not that you wouldn't, not, not that you wouldn't be sensitive to it, but you won't stop believing in what you believe in. You won't stop rehearsing the righteous acts. You'll keep praying. You'll keep inter interceding. Right? Um, so, let's finish this up. So, because of these things, it will come to pass when they say in their thoughts. Uh, quiet down a little bit. Their, people will say in their thoughts, by the reason of their much tribulation, tri tribulation is trials. That the mighty one, that a higher, the almighty, the almighty one does no longer remember the earth. 
Yes, it will come to pass when they abandon hope. Giving you what we said. What, what, what scripture is that? Yeshia. It says, when I return to earth. Is that Luke 18 and 8? Luke 18 and 8. Now, when I return to earth, will there be any more faith? That's the question we must ask ourselves. Will I still be in the faith? Will you still be in the faith? Okay? Because remember, I mean, you know, we're going to need patience, brothers and sisters. You know, when coming to learn the Most High, you must be steadfast. And you're going to have to have patience and endurance. The race is not given to the swift. The battle is not given to those who are strong, meaning by their own physical force. force. Their own physical force or strength is by the hand of the Most High. All right? And then they'll, they'll bend the hope that the time will then awake. So we're right at that time. We're right on the heels, right at the doorsteps of the coming of our blessed Savior. All right? So you brothers and sisters, I pray that you are encouraged and uplifted. And I pray that my brothers and sisters here, um, you know, that you've enjoyed the word today. And uh, that you were blessed by it. And uh, so we wish you brothers and sisters the highest speed. We want to say keep the faith. Uh, be encouraged and uplifted and empowered today and always. Salah and armor up. Shalom.